so double legs. They're both three legs. So that one is for the building. And then that one is for the actual room. And the room, there's a lot of ventilation in the back, so it's definitely not. I don't know. I think because one of them is just going to the camera, it's not a big deal. But I'm sure Kevin will let you know. Just probably. Never been double mic'd before. Thank you, Derek. I'm really happy to be here now that I'm back in Canada. So I've sp I spent the last six years down at Ohio State um, after my PhD at UBC. And so some of the data that I'm going to show today is kind of a mix of what I did at UBC and what I did at OSU uh, with the hope of continuing along these lines because this is, of all the topics that I study, I would say my favorite topic um, to do research on. So why study maternal behavior? What got me interested in this topic? Um, there's a lot of research done around the time period that a cow gives birth uh, for lots of reasons. So there's multiple stressors around this time period. She's moving between different social groups. Um, her calf is taken away from her. There's a lot of pain associated with labor. There's highly variable housing. If anyone, um, uh, many of you have likely been on dairy farms, there's no two dairy farms that look the same when it comes to their maternity pin design. So there really wasn't, before I started doing my research, some best practices around the housing itself and management of cows um, right around the time of labor. And then there is, of course, a high risk of disease after calving. There's lots of things that contribute to that, starting even well before the cow uh, undergoes labor. So um, that said, although there's been lots of research, there's still a lot of unknowns about why some cows get sick and others don't. And in general, there was a lack of understanding about cow behavior right around calving. We had done some work in the couple weeks before calving, in the couple weeks after calving, but not really focused on that time period uh, when the cow is in the maternity area, right around labor. So that's kind of why we uh, did some of this early work and why I've continued in this area. And the more research I, deal, I do, like with other topics, just um, there's more research questions that come out of it. So there's still lots that we can do in this, this area. So what does the matern maternity area typically look like? So here's two examples. Um, there's lots of different uh, ways that people can manage their cows at calving. So if you go to a tie stall, often they're, they calve in the tie stall. Um, if you're on a free stall or some tie stalls, we'll move cows into an individual pen that looks something like this. Maybe there's a bedded straw pack, um, 10 foot by 10 foot, 12 foot by 12 foot, something like that, individual pen. Um, or uh, a lot of dairy farms also 
have cows in groups. So they might have them um, variable stocking densities, variable sizes, uh, but they'll be in this pen for maybe a couple of days to a couple of weeks before they give birth, and then they give birth in the pen. So is there one system that's better than others? What are, how do we understand the cow's experience during this time that will allow us to make improvements to these, the way we house and manage cows around this time? So a couple of approaches that we've taken with this research. Um, one is to understand the natural behavior of cows right around calving. So what do cows do if they're in a natural setting? Um, what's their behavior? Are there certain things that they do in preparation of calving that might be important for us to know to help us build better maternity pens? And then we can ask the cow what environment she prefers um, or what she's motivated to access when calving. So are there are certain environments that they want to be in and we can, can we build those for them um, in an indoor facility? Uh, so this is, uh, the rest of the talk is really on the research associated with these approaches. So what happens in a natural setting? So if we take cows, we take the cows at Alora, we put them out on pasture, out, out on range, and we give them all the opportunities in the world to uh, calve wherever they wanted. Where will they go and what will they do? So there was a study done back in the 90s in uh, Sweden, I believe. Well, researchers did this. They took dairy cows and they moved them uh, into a 50-acre pasture, or a kind of variable terrain, um, and they recorded where cows calved and uh, what features of the calving site look like. So what do we think? So if we put cows outside, where do they calve? <coughs> yeah. In a wooded area, yeah. Yeah? Somewhere hidden and secluded, yeah. So that's what they found and that's, uh, there's some other ungulates that do the same thing. So if you look at moose in nature, they'll hide themselves in their calves right around calving. So they found they only had a, a small sample size. They, over two years, they had 14 dairy cows calve, 64% uh, separated from the herd to calve. Um, and then the other remained in a barn. So some, it sort of was seclusion as well, but more man-made seclusion. Um, heifers calving for the first time separated the furthest, especially if they were disturbed while they are in the middle of labor. And then features of a calving site, is two kind of examples. Obviously this is not a dairy calf, this is a beef calf, and you see this in the beef cow-calf industry as well. When cows calve, they tend to find tall grass, uh, they look for a soft surface to calve, like dead leaves or dead grass. Um, they look for tree cover, so it's a little bit hard to see, but this is a calf right here in the corner. So this cow, this is a picture from New Zealand. Um, she separated herself from the herd. She found a tree and a fence, something to give her that feeling of a little bit of protection. And probably for a couple reasons, so it might be an anti-predator strategy. Uh, so cows and their calves are very vulnerable right when, uh, during parturition. So maybe they're hiding from predators. But it could also be a way for the cow to separate from other cows. And that might give her the opportunity to build a bond with her calf without interference from other cows. And that's really important in the beef industry with cow-calf because the cow raises the calf. Less important for us in the dairy industry right now because we separate the two but the cow still might have that motivation to hide herself from other cows. So when you don't have 50 acres, obviously this isn't something we can go to a dairy producer and say, give your cow some trees when they're calving. That'd be nice, they like it. Some tall grass would be nice. Um, this is a kind of a, a in-between sort of compromise um, that you can do in some parts of the world. So this is in Tennessee. Uh, they calve on pasture often in the summertime or in the fall. So this study we did with the University of Tennessee where we gave cows access to pasture um, before calving. They had access to a couple of other resources. Uh, we wanted to know if cows had access to a small pasture and a barn, where would they give birth? Would they like going out into the pasture to give birth? Would they calve in the barn? And then what factors impact their decision? of where they chose to calve. 
So for this study, we used 64 cows, a half heifers, half older cows. Uh, they had access to pasture about three weeks before calving. And then we measured where they chose to calve. The way we did this was, um, this is an aerial view from Google Maps of the pasture. So this white blob down here, this is the barn. And this area is a pasture. Uh, we broke it up into sections just to give us an easier way of seeing where they chose to calve, which section they chose to calve. And then we had cameras uh, throughout the whole area so that we could watch the cows. They had no privacy. And then the, the pasture, there was a couple areas. So kind of this middle area was very open. And then area nine, I'll show a picture of, um, had a little bit more coverage. So there's tree cover around and there was tall grass. And so we looked at how things like their parity and the temperature, humidity. It was Tennessee in the, in the summer and fall, so quite variations in temperature and humidity across those periods impact their choice. So this is what the barn looked like. So it was a bedded straw pack, and they did get a TMR delivered every day, once a day. There was a water bin inside the barn, but there was also a water bin on the pasture as well. This is what the pasture looked like, that sort of middle part of the pasture. Ah, and then we decided to do something clever that ended up not working, but I'll share it with you anyways. We thought, cows want to hide. Let's build them hides in the middle of pasture, and they're going to use them to hide, and we can sell them and make millions. Um, but it turns out, of our 64 cows that calved, only three of them used these hides. So they were not successful as calving hides. However, as you can tell, they were successful as loungers for cows to spend their time in, especially when it was hot outside. So, which may have interfered with the cow wanting to use it to calve, we don't know. But in general, these didn't really work from a calving perspective. Um, but cows want shade on pasture in Tennessee, who knew? So this is what the area of natural forage looked like. So there was actually a little bit of change in altitude. So it was a little bit higher and then um, went down a little bit in the back. We let the grass grow, so it's a bit taller grass. And then we had the trees around the edge as well. So where did they calf? So where do we think they calved? So how many of you think they calved in the barn? Nobody? Yeah, a couple of you. Um, how about the, the open pasture? OK, how about the, the back pasture with the trees and the tall grass? That's where a lot of you thought they calved. Anything you think might influence that decision? Yeah? Great question. Were there people around in the barn all the time, but not everywhere else? Um, not really. So this area was pretty separated from the rest of the farm. So they'd have people there. Uh, there were people there checking the cows to, if they were calving on a pretty regular basis, but that would have been throughout the entire area. So maybe a little more human interaction in the barn, but generally probably not too much. All right, so what did we find? So this is just descriptive, shows the number of calvings that happened in each area. So the barn, number one here. So we had quite a few cows calve in the barn. Um, didn't really like that open area of pasture. So overall, if you add all that together, it was about the same number in the barn. Um, but overall, they didn't really look like they avoided that area. And then the area of natural forage was the other area that they calved in. So you were half right. Um, but it was impacted by parity. So heifers chose a different, made a different decision than older cows. So where do we think heifers chose to calve? Did they like the barn or did they like the area of natural forage? How do you say the barn? A couple of you, forage? Yeah, and that's exactly what we found. So cows, cows were more likely to calve in the barn. Heifers were more likely to calve in the area of natural forage. And that could be due to a number of things. So it could be previous experience. So older animals may have calved in the barn before. They may have also calved on pasture before. So it was, it was kind of a mix. Um, it could, have, it could uh, be to, due to social status in the herd. Maybe heifers wanted to separate farther away from other animals and were looking less for seclusion, more for separation. So we don't know that for sure, but that's, a, I think, an interesting question. 
So when we asked, we did this that was descriptively, so the way we looked at this um, statistically is we just looked at predictors of where the cows chose to calve. And uh, they were more likely to calve in the area of natural forage if they were heifers, uh, but also if THI was low. So they were more likely to calve in the barn when temperature and humidity was high. So maybe the barn provided a little more shade. There was no fans in the barn, so there wasn't any extra heat abatement. Um, or maybe they didn't want to walk across a long pasture when it was really hot and humid outside but these both came out. We looked at a number of other things. So we looked also at um, the stocking density of the pen, if that affected their behavior, and that didn't. Um, the percentage of heifers to cows, because that was a little variable over the trial, and that didn't affect anything. Um, it was really just these two that came out as important. Okay, so how can we apply this indoors? So that was very much based on, we wanted to understand more natural behavior, we wanted to understand the factors that impact cows calving, but in PEI, we can't really calve cows outside in the middle of winter. Um, I'm sure it's the same here, so you probably don't have many dairy producers doing that. So A, does this even matter indoors? Is a barn enough? Does that enough protection for them? Um, or do they want even more? And so that's the questions we asked during my PhD at the University of British Columbia. So do cows still want to find a secluded area even though they're already in a barn? Um, and maybe they're already separated. Maybe they're in an individual pen. Maybe we already take them out of a group and put them in their own space. So is that enough separation? Often when, we, when I go on dairy farms, I see this pen uh, typically near the milking parlor, often in a high traffic area. Uh, so we still don't know, or I'll show some uh, some research kind of on whether or not cows, even if they're by themselves, still want to have that seclusion. And then in a group pen, it really probably depends on the size of the pen and the stocking density, whether they have the opportunity to separate or not. So this was the first study we did at UBC, uh, rather impractical but good from a research perspective study, where we took a freestall pen and we ripped out all the freestalls and we created two areas for a cow to calf. She could either calve in this, what we called open bedded pack. So it was a sawdust bedded pack. Um, and if we could see on the other side of the picture, there was an alley on that side. There was an alley on that side. And then their alternative was to go into this shelter that we built out of plywood, um, eight foot tall, 24 foot wide, uh, that they could also use to calve. So cows came into this pen about three days before they gave birth. Um, and we wanted to make sure this wasn't just a novel or a scary thing for the cows, so we made sure they, they used it as a scratching post, actually, pretty, pretty readily. Um, but they checked it out, and they went inside, and then we measured which, where they chose to calve, whether they liked the shelter or not. Uh, that pin was replicated four times in a different, um, having the shelter in a different location. So in two of the pins, it was on this side. Two of the pins, it was on the other side. There's about 72 cows we used with no calving difficulty. We did have heifers and cows in this study too. Um, they were in there about three days before calving. And then we had them either by themselves or with a partner um, to see if that would affect their decision where they chose to calve. So what did we find? So in general, we found that cows were more likely to calve in the shelter, but it wasn't a very strong uh, response, so they, they did like it. Some of them did, some of them calved in the open area, but more of them calved in the shelter. However, this decision was affected by uh, the time of day of calving. So if, you, if we looked at the data based on did cows calve uh, in the middle of the night or did cows calve in the middle of the day, uh, then they made a different decision. So do you think that cows decided to calve in the shelter uh, more if it was the daytime or the nighttime? How many say daytime? Nighttime? A couple of you? Yeah, so we did find that they were more likely to use the shelter if it was the daytime. So the black bars show nighttime. Uh, it was about 50 50, if anything. If they calved at night, it was, they were a little bit more likely to calve in the open area. Um, but the blue bars show daytime. So about 80% of the cows that calved in the daytime went into the shelter to calf. 
And we don't know why exactly, but maybe it has to do with the fact that during the daytime, there is more noise and activity and things <coughs> happening in the barn. And maybe even in nature, it doesn't make sense for them at night. Although in our previous study, we did find that at night, um, they did still, they would still uh, hide, but maybe in this particular case, it didn't matter. This graph shows, uh, so another question we have is, if they calved in the shelter, did they just like the shelter all the time? Was it just uh, cows like being in this new place? It had nothing to do with the fact they're having a baby. They just happened to be in there when they had the baby because it was something that they liked. So we wanted to see if behavior changed as calving approached. So the way we did this is we looked at their use of the, the hide, the shelter, 12 hours before calving. And then we subtracted that from their use of the shelter on a baseline period a day or two days before um, the same time of day. So that if it's positive here, that means they use the shelter more often just before calving than they would have normally. So you can see what we did with this is we, we tried to find a cut point if there was a point when cows started to change their behavior. Um, so around eight hours is when it looks like they started increasing their use of the, of the shelter before calving, which may coincide with the first stage of labor. So that might be uh, uh, when there's certain hormones that are going through that make them feel like now is the time for me to find a secluded place to give birth. So here's a short video of a cow using one of the hides. So you can see she's in stage two labor, actually. The calf's feet are out. And in this particular design, you know, we didn't really think, it, we didn't know exactly what the cows would want. So she could go back here and it was very, very hidden. Um, or she could calve closer to the doorway where they could, she could still see out a little bit. And I, di I didn't record where they chose to calve, but a lot of them calved at the doorway, maybe because they don't want total seclusion. They still want to be able to see out a little bit. Ah, but then when we had two cows in the pen, the opposite happened, which is the opposite of our hypothesis. Our hypothesis was that if there's two cows in the pen, they're going to be more likely to hide because they want to separate from other cows. But we found actually that cows were more likely to calve in the open area if there were two cows in the pen instead of one. And there's probably, there, I went back to the video, so when I still was a PhD student, had lots of copious amounts of spare time to watch cow videos, um, to see if there was a general pattern that was happening, like why are the cows now using, uh, not using the shelter? And there wasn't a clear pattern that came out, but something we did look at was um, how close they were to their partner um, when, as calving approached. So we took the same approach as looking at the 12 hours before calving, subtracting from a baseline. Um, so if it's positive, that means they spent more time. When I say away from their partner, that means greater than one cow length or in a different area. So maybe when they calved, the other cow was in the shelter and they preferred to be outside the shelter because they didn't want to be next to another cow. So we did see that not quite as clearly as the other graph, they did start to uh, increase their distance from their neighbor as calving approached. And when we did the cut point analysis, it was around the same time period, a little bit after eight hours. And then we saw stuff like this. So this is a, a cow that's, the one that's in the back is actually in the middle of labor. And she's decided that nobody else can use her house. <laughs> so we did see some of this sort of resource guarding behavior. So this is something that she cared about deep leaves having this shelter for herself. So you can see her tail is raised. Um, so she's starting labor. So we did see some of that. So that was kind of an important outcome of that study is that if we do take this and apply it to a group setting, we have to think about the fact there's going to be social competition over something like this because it would be considered a resource to the cows. So we have to think about that when we design. We can't just make one little hide for 20 cows. That's probably not going to work. 
So then we did a second follow-up study with the University of Aarhus in Denmark uh, where we wanted to make this more practical, uh, at least for an individual pin. And then we did a little more work with group pins I'll show you next. So obviously no dairy producer is going to go build an 8-foot tall, 24-foot wide shelter in the maternity pin, nor should, should, should they. Um, so we had this design in Denmark where it was kind of neat. They had their close-up cows in this middle pin. And then they had these individual pins that lined that pin. So as a cow was getting close to calving, they could shuffle her into one of these pins. So then we took that pin and we made a little hiding space, so just a corner of the pen, um, where they could either hide themselves a little on this side, and this was a 12 foot by 12 foot, it looks a little bit small, and then there's another side where they could have no snows or visual contact with cows in the group. And then we recorded which side they calved on, what I called the corner side or the window into the group. And so here we saw pretty clearly that they liked the corner. So they, many, uh, about 80% of them calved in the corner side as opposed to the window side. So a very practical way of doing this, and I've seen lots, so I'll show later some other examples of how you can do this um, in a way that is much more practical on farm. So what about groups? So this was a follow-up study we did when I went to OSU. Um, and so this was done at the Minor Institute in New York, uh, again with the University of Tennessee. And here we, our questions were, could we build sort of a blind in this calving pen, a very practical way of letting them hide, and does stocking density impact the cow's behavior and their ability um, to hide if they want to? So I'll show a little bit of data from this. Um, my graduate student, Kate, is still at OSU, and she's still working on this, so I'll show some descriptive data. Um, but she's taking a lot of, she took a lot of information from the cows. Uh, so in this study, we also looked at um, their physiological health. We looked at um, their behavior, very detailed behavior right around calving to see what things like stocking to see influence how much disturbance a cow had during labor, did that impact the length of their labor, and things like that. So I don't have the answers to all those questions, but if I come back in a couple years, uh, then I can give you those, those answers from her work. So we had 345 cows in this study. Um, it was a dynamic social structure, and we used a two-by-two two factorial arrangement of treatments, uh, which was stocking density. And I'll go into that a little bit more, but this was 100, per, 100 square feet per cow versus 200 square feet per cow, and then with or without a blind or a place for them to hide. And then pens were replicated um, four times with each of those four treatments, so it was a 16 replicates. So we do call this high stocking density, although I will say I've seen much higher stocking density than this. Uh, um, on farms, but this is kind of what has been recommended in the past, 100 square feet per cow of usable lying space. And that's what that looks like. And then we compared it to 200 square feet, which would obviously give the cow more opportunity to separate if she wanted to. And then this is what our blind looked like. So um, I'm going to give the credit to this for this design to Heather Dan. We went back and forth. We had these like X designs, we had cows had to walk outside the pen to another pen design, we had lots of different things we tried, but this ended up being the most practical um, uh, design we came up with, where it would allow more than one cow to use it at a time, um, and it was something that a dairy producer could easily implement. So this is a Jersey road barrier they use in construction, and when it's empty, it's about 100 pounds, so easy for two people to lift. And when it's filled with water, the, the cows can't destroy it. That was our number one criteria for a blind, is can the cows knock it down? And they couldn't. So this is what it looked like with the blind. Um, my graduate student also thought she'd get creative, and we made a little, like a shade cloth in the background, and then a little extra place they could hide in the back there. Um, so that's our high stocking density with a blind and our low stocking density with a blind. So yeah, to get the low stocking density, we just doubled the size of the pen. We didn't want to change the number of cows in the pen. So the number of the cows in the pen stayed the same. The size of the pen changed. So then we, we essentially just replicated the small pen on this side with the blind.
So for the data that I'll show, um, the way that we, we kind of got an understanding of where cows chose to calve, did they like the blind to calve, did they like the back corner, where is it in the pen that they like to calve, uh, we used a grid, which is about 10 feet by 10 feet, um, so that the hide was in, it looks a bit odd in this picture, but the hide was in the center grid. And it was, um, uh, if the cow was in that grid, we consider her using the hide. That makes sense. So the way I'll show her data um, is in it, kind of a heat map. So where cows chose to calve and how many calved in each area. And I'll start with the low stocking density. So this is kind of an aerial view of the pen. So if we're looking down on top of the pen, this is just the lying space. And then these little things here are the doorways. So this is the door into the feed alley. That's the door out into the transfer alley. And then as the color gets darker, uh, the more cows calved in that particular grid area. So I think you could probably guess where the barrier was. So in this, this is our low stocking density with a blind, low stocking density without a blind. So the cows were very attracted to the blind. So about 40% of them calved uh, near the blind. But I think what's also interesting here is there are clear areas that the cows uh, didn't want to calve in, particularly around the doorways, which makes sense. Um, but we're thinking about what is usable lying space for a cow, especially around calving, um, then I wouldn't call those very usable from the cow's perspective. And then if she didn't have a blind, uh, she kind of distributed, they sort of distributed them themselves all around the pen, maybe a little bit more in the middle. This is around where the water bin was, which is a bit weird, but they liked being next to that a little bit more. But not really a clear pattern compared to when they had the blind. And this was our high stocking density pen, so we saw the same pattern, or this is where they did have the blind in the middle. They didn't really like the back, so we thought that shade cloth, you know, they might like going behind the blind and into the corner, um, but I, actually they didn't as much as being right next to the blind, so they really like pushing themselves up against the blind. Again, you can see around the doorways, they generally avoided those areas and then uh, not a really clear pattern with a, with a high stocking density. So it'll be interesting to look at this data statistically because it does look like um, there's definitely a very clear effect here. A little bit less clear effect, but it's partially driven by the fact that they have less options of where they're gonna calve. But fewer of them calved um, in next to the blind in the high stocking density compared to the low stocking density. So that's what, what this shows again just descriptively uh, the percentage of cows that calved low stocking density with a blind compared to without a blind in that one grid area. Um, very clear difference and then a few, a, l a little bit less when they had high stocking density. So high stocking density may, we don't know yet, but may interfere with the ability to use the blind. All right, I'm just going to wrap up with one more study um, just to show we've talked about preference so far and this was um, the first study that looked at motivation around a calving blind, this was done at University of Aarhus by Margie Vakjensen and Maria Roerving. So they had a blind um, where they gave cows the option to calve in a group area in the middle, similar to the study I showed earlier, or they could come into this um, separate individual pen, either with a gate, or sorry, without a gate, or with a gate. And this gate allowed cows to come through, it would lock behind them, so no other cows could come in. Um, but if they wanted to leave, then they could. It shows a video of Maria training the cow to use it. You could pretty much get a cow to do anything with a bucket of grain, apparently. So they trained them to do this in the three weeks before calving, and they weren't included in the study if they never learned how to do it on their own. And then they watched the cows as they calved, and they recorded where they chose to calve. 
So what did they find? So they found the way they analyzed it was just by did they cabin the group area compared to the individual area? And then was that impacted by whether the gate was open or closed? Because they had both options. And so it was about 50-50 whether they calved in the group area uh, compared to the individual pin. And then they found that it was more likely, they're more likely to calve in the individual pin if the gate was open and not closed. It was also more likely for cows that um, they had used some separate tests to score uh, whether they were dominant at the feed bunk or whether they were bold in a, in a test. I think it was a novel object test. And cows that were bolder or more dominant at the feed bunk were more likely to calve in the individual pen. But that kind of told us that they didn't really like the idea of pushing through a gate um, to go into that individual, because that would be the coolest way of doing it, right? Let's let cows choose to isolate on their own, and we give them the option to do it, and then we can um, close that gate so then other cows can't come in and potentially take their calf, things like that. Um, so it did work for some of them, but I think maybe it comes down to the fact that during labor, the cow may not like to push through something. Maybe she is experiencing a lot of pain, or maybe at that moment she's not thinking about, oh, I remember I learned how to do this thing, um, but now I've just completely forgotten what, what thing I was supposed to do, so I'm just going to go with the easy way. Maybe there's another way of understanding their, their motivation to hide. Maybe having them walk a longer distance would make more sense from a natural behavior perspective. So really cool study, um, but I think it opened up for lots more questions about how to do this. So a couple pictures of what some producers have done with this idea. So this is a farm in Wisconsin where they have their individual maternity pens on this side um, and then they put up this curtain. So previously this, these pens were very exposed to trucks in the feed alley, noise in the pens and things like that. Um, and so their solution was, was a curtain. So. Um, a little bit nicer than my $50 plywood solution. Um, but yeah, kind of a, a different neat idea, and they really liked it. And then this is a, a barn in Ohio where their maternity pen is in the holding area to the parlor, and so they put up a corrugated metal wall basically to separate their calving pens from, from the holding area. So it doesn't have to be a complicated design, um, but kind of a practical way of letting the cow have a little bit more isolation when she's in an individual pen. I think in a group pen, we still have a lot to understand about how to do that well. All right, so I'll wrap up. Um, so in general, the, uh, the kind of route that I've taken with my research is to understand natural behavior and preferences in cows um, and use that to help us build better facilities for them. Some cows seek isolation when giving birth indoors and on pasture. And um, I think one of the key things here is giving cows choice because we didn't find that all the cows like the hide. Some of the cows didn't like the hide, but we gave them the opportunity to use it if they wanted to. So giving them the opportunity to choose whether they want to be in a more secluded area where they want to separate from other cows um, and finding practical but also creative ways of how to do that. And that's all I got. So thank you very much. Good. We are open to questions or comments, please. Right here. Yes. Yeah, great question. So the question is, do we know um, of any studies where, cat, where we've actually measured stress response during calving? and if that's influenced by their environment, including if they have the ability to hide. Because I think the hypothesis would be if they wanted to hide and we give them that opportunity, they might be less stressed than if they wanted to hide and we don't give them that opportunity. So the short answer is no, there hasn't been any work in the area. Um, Kate is gonna look at that a little bit. She's gonna look at their using just their behavior around labor um, to see if she can identify uh, signs that like if they're constantly getting up and moving and getting up and moving. Uh, we could do physiological indicators of stress, but it's a little challenging because cortisol, which is not the best indicator of stress, but it increases at calving anyways. 
Um, so it's a little more challenging, uh, but I think we'll have a little bit of an understanding with some of the behavioral stuff, but great question. Yeah. Uh, the dairy farmers who put up curtains in Wisconsin, uh, and then there's the corrugated metal version, you mentioned that they liked that. Um, what is it that they liked about that? Were there metrics that they were using to influence their relative like or dislike? Yep, great question. So the question is, uh, for those producers that have used hiding spaces, what is it about it that they've liked? Um, and I've heard anecdotal things that haven't been substantiated with research, but I'll tell you the anecdotal things. Um, so the Wisconsin farmer anecdotally said that for his heifers, it reduced his dystocias. So that's what he thought, and I don't, again, I don't know if it's true or not, um, but he saw a change particularly in his heifers, and that's what, why he liked it. Um, with other producers, they haven't necessarily, they, they probably have seen some things like that we haven't measured, maybe in their risk of dystocia, things like that, but I think a lot of it's this, that kind of an intuitive um, way of housing a cow at calving. I think when I talk to farmers about this, often they say like, yes, I knew that. So like I could tell my cows wanted to hide and now I'm giving them the chance to do it. Uh, so they like the ability to let their cows use a natural behavior that, that they had a sense already that they had without any of the economic or disease or any outcomes related to it. Other questions? Yes. Does the provision of a high uh, effect when one should intervene with the cow? Great question. So does the provision of the hide affect uh, when to intervene uh, during calving? So I don't think it would affect when we should intervene. It might, I mean, my hope is that it could affect the need to intervene. Again, we don't have the data to support that. Um, but when we've done these studies, we've asked, especially at minor, at minor when we started, 50% of the calves were being pulled. And so we had to kind of stage an intervention and say, do we really need to pull all the calves? Um, it was just part of their normal practice. So we asked them, you know, as part of this project, we really want you to pull when you really think that there's a problem. So, you know, there's watch when they start stage two labor and it's been 60 minutes and they're not making progress every 15, 20 minutes or it's clear there's one leg or the back legs or whatever and there is a need to intervene. And so that actually changed, dramatically decreased pulls uh, to what really needed to be pulled. But I think kind of what, what we have to be careful about here is that if you're building a hiding space, you don't want them to be completely hidden from people to be able to see them to know when to intervene. So I highly recommend cameras, um, which I know a lot of producers are now using in their maternity pens. Um, instead of coming in often and, and checking, I think it makes more sense to try to watch without disturbing the cows. Because that's something else I think that we, we maybe get a little bit too excited when cows are calving. We want to go in and we want to help, but the cow might see that in a different way. Yep. Have you or anyone else ever looked at boats? Good question, yeah. So have we looked at the number of lying bouts when they're given a hide or not? And so that's something that Kate is gonna measure. We had loggers on all the cows. Um, we also put loggers on the cows on pasture and we found that compared to some of the previous work, uh, there were fewer bouts around calving when they're on pasture. And that could be due to a number of things, but it might, uh, you could um, predict that perhaps if they, have the opportunity to find a place to hide. Maybe they don't need to get up and down as much. Maybe some of that getting up and down is they're trying to find a, more, a better place to be in their, in their environment and they, they can't find it. So I think with Kate's study, we'll, we'll get a sense of that, at least with that blind. And I don't know if that blind is enough to affect that behavior, but maybe. question. So do I have a sense of whether cows are more interested in isolating themselves from other cows or from human activity? And I don't know, sorry to say, I don't know to all these questions, I'm an academic, um, but I don't know for sure, but we did see, like we did predict that in that first study we did, 
that the cows would be more likely to hide when there was another cow in the pen. Um, and we didn't find that probably for lots of reasons, but the day-night effect kind of, I think that adds to the possibility that um, when there's a lot of activity in the barn, then that affects their decision. And there has been some work actually in um, deer that have shown that deer will calve when there is human activity. Um, at night, they will calve near human activity. Um, like there was a study that used, I don't remember who's a mine site or something like that. There's a lot of noise and activity. But during the, when that mine site was going during the daytime, they completely avoided it. So there, it's not just cows. I think there is that they're not only hiding from other cows. I think it's both and they're hiding from, from noisy things that could potentially be threatening or dangerous. Because uh, as a prey animal, they probably are highly motivated to escape threats when they're in the middle of labor. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, my question is, do we have any fundamental work that's been done on what the characteristics are of locations where cows want to isolate themselves? I noticed that a lot of the artificial uh, structures that you use didn't have, have mm, overhead, overhead cover. Yep. And so thinking, is it a place that's dark, or is it a place that's quiet, or what exactly? Yep. Do you know anything about that? Great question. Do I have to repeat that, or we got that on the? OK. So um, there's there was a little bit of follow-up work in Denmark right after we did that initial uh, corner study where they did look at different sizes and shapes. Nothing overhead though, but they looked at a tall and skinny versus a fat and short, because maybe just tall grass is enough. Maybe that's you know enough for them to hide. And whether they had a preference for shape of a hide. And they found generally no preference, except cows that um, had a prolonged labor were more likely to calve in the most secluded area. So that was the only difference they found. Um, the overhead one, that's something we talked about a lot when we made those hides on pasture. Um, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that. And that is something that we've, we've talked about, what the, if that should be in our design. But um, we, we kind of came to the conclusion that cows don't have any predators from above, but maybe the calf would. So maybe they care about um, being seen from above. So yeah, I think that would be really interesting to look at that especially from the calf's perspective. So I think calves are motivated to hide too. And they might like having some overhead coverage. We may have time for one last question. Talking about predators, were there 50 acre study Oh, the 50 acre study, that was done before my time. Um, I don't think so, if there wasn't any reported. In our study in Tennessee, there were none. Um, but I think they're really good there. Of, uh, making sure. I don't know if there are many natural predators there. They don't have wolves. I don't actually know what the natural predators down there, but we didn't have any problems with that. But yeah, of course, that's something that should be considered. Okay. It is time to finish up the seminar portion for now. You are all invited to join us next door in 1810 for some coffee, some more discussion about this very interesting line of work. And having said that, would you all join me one last time in thanking Dr. Bowford for her seminar?